Hello everyone and welcome to the show. It's Travel with you today and I'm joined by my special guest, Peter Mead. Now, Peter is the Vice Chairman of the biggest advertising agency in the world, Omnicom Group Inc. And also, over 40 years ago, he co-founded Abbott Mead Vickers, which is the most successful British advertising agency ever and has been for a long time. Are you, are you seeing a trend here? You know that success leaves clues, don't you? So, Peter's authored the book, Nice is Not a Biscuit, which is the go-to guide to build a world-class business the right way. And he's here to unpack some of his wisdom and expertise on the episode today. So hopefully you're ready to learn. Definitely pay attention, take some notes. Welcome to the show, Peter Mead. Thanks for joining us. It's very kind. Thank you for having me. It's great to have the opportunity to, to chat with you. Success does leave clues. Um, so you're obviously doing... Been some things right. You've learned, I'm sure, some challenges along the way on how not to do things and how to do things the right way, which is now what you're able to share with, with everybody. So very interested in, in digging into all of that. Maybe just to start with, um, you've got a big story. There's lots of different ways you can go with this, but just share a little bit about who Peter is and what's sort of brought you on your, on your journey to where you are today. Okay. Um... I'm a Londoner, I'm a South London boy, um, born in the same hospital as Michael Caine, um, grew, grew up within the sound of Bow Bells, so as I said I'm technically a Cockney, yeah. and until I was 17 uh, I had a broad Cockney accent and it used to make Del Boy Trotter seem like a Cambridge Don. Um, <laughs> so, um, but, at, at 16, uh, I was at a grammar school and I was, I, I claim I was lazy, but I probably wasn't gifted enough. Uh, I only got uh, two O levels uh, at school, uh, grammar school, geography, because the master was a serial sort of abuser who used to cane us all the time. <laughs> uh, so our performance sadly uh, reflected our fear of him. Yeah. And, um, and English literature, which uh, is an influence that stayed with me all my life. At that stage, most of my contemporaries at grammar school were going to, or going to the sixth form to go on to university. I patently wasn't equipped to do that, either financially through my parents uh, or academically through my laziness. Um, and I met a man, I was sent to visit a man uh, called a youth employment officer and he said to me what do you think you want to do with your life uh, and i said uh, i want to be a pilot but i've got bad eyesight for some reason i said i wanted to be a civil servant i must have, <laughs> must have been completely off my trolley um, but then a flash of light came and my father had recently bought our first radiogram which was a, a sort of go-to piece of furniture in uh, in the 50s and 60s. And so I suddenly said to him, hey, what I think I'd really like to do is join a record company and meet the stars. And he said, you mean advertising? And I didn't at all. I didn't know what about the advertising <laughs> um, So he gave me a couple, couple of introductions to two very large agencies, both of whom offered me a job in the dispatch department of their companies at three pounds, 10 shillings a week, which is three pounds 50 in today's money. Yeah. And, and um, I, went to, I went to the one I went to because the other one, uh, I was being interviewed by a lady who was in those days in, in, in the department, which is now human resources. Uh, which was then called Personnel, um, which is sort of, sort of a better name than Human Resources, really, a much, a much, much, much more reflection uh, yeah. of what they were doing. And she said to me, "Yes, well, I think." And she was in a, a Chanel suit with pearl earrings, a pearl necklace, and everything else. And she said to me, "Yes, I think we can offer you a job in our dispatch department at three pounds ten shillings a week. We have a staff canteen here." But sadly, um, it's rather too expensive for you to eat in it. Uh, but you may eat your sandwiches in Barclays Square. So I, being a South London uh, Millwall supporter, I said, 
um, thank you very much, but no thanks, and went to the other agency. <laughs> and as a small aside, uh, some uh, 25 years later, uh, we became the biggest agency in the country, the biggest advertising agency in the country. Yeah. And the one we overlooked was the one who said I could eat my sandwiches in Berkeley Square. So I rather sort of tartly, I guess, uh, got a little Tupperware box of sandwiches and sat in Berkeley Square and ate my sandwiches. Which <laughs> is mildly pathetic, but, but, but gently satisfying. Yeah, uh, yeah. And and then sort of luck took a took a role in my life. I I seemed to do quite well in the dispatch department. Became an office boy, which was a great way of discovering what a company is all about because you're delivering stuff all over the place. Sadly, it doesn't exist anymore because everybody talks to one another electronically as opposed to yeah. sending one another notes. Um, and went through, joined a number of agencies, started my first company when I was 31, uh, got, got ousted for that for sort of understandable but still not very good uh, reasons, and then started Abbott Mead Vickers, um, which as you say for, for a long, long time uh, was the biggest in the country and, and was until about 18 months ago the biggest, mm. and had been 20 years. Yeah. Um, and was described by my campaign magazine, which is the Advertising Bible, as probably the most successful advertising agency ever. Um, mm -hmm. and, yeah. and how I got there really is encapsulated by one of the lessons in the books, a book which said that life is a mix of strategy and opportunity, with opportunity being much more important than strategy. The trouble is you don't know when opportunity is going to come by definition. Yeah. But you have to be so you have a strategy going forward, knowing it will get interrupted by opportunity, but not knowing when it will get interrupted by opportunity, but not being afraid when opportunity comes along to throw away your strategy and follow your opportunity. Yeah. And um, and that's the way I went through life. Because I've always believed that uh, people people respond much better to decent behaviour and mm -hmm. being uh, looked after and treated with some sort of dignity. Uh, it's not very difficult to to start a business if you if you have a set of operating principles and beliefs, then most of the decisions you make are guided by those operating principles and beliefs, and that's the way. It, it, it's gone all my life and 40 odd years ago um, I started a business with two other guys who felt exactly the same so to say it was effortless well, it is obviously not true but yeah. um, it was a lot less uh, um, difficult because I was, I was we were all singing from the same song sheet yeah. and I had people who liked the sound of the songs yeah, yeah, I was going to ask you actually about, so when you met sort of David Abbott and also Adrian Vickers, did you know straight away because you had sort of similar values and the way you, you handle or the way you look after people, was there like a, a a natural chemistry, if you like, that you thought, yeah, we could really make something work here? Or was, was uh, it a bit of a journey to discover? It was a bit of a journey. I, the first company I started, uh, Adrian and and, and uh, David weren't involved in at all, right. uh, but it was pretty successful until I made the terrible mistake having having raised all the money to start the agency, and having a third of the equity. I gave the other two thirds to my other four partners uh, in the agency, and had a had a rather silly belief that companies could be run as a collective um, that all decisions will be decided amongst the five of us um, and everything going for and I thought that's a wonderful way to create harmony yeah. of course it's nonsense I mean <laughs> um, my partners were skilled at ver the various uh, talents they had in the advertising business one was a writer 
one was an art director, uh, uh, one was a media man, and one was a suit uh, and account handler. Um, um, I don't know if anybody has seen uh, Mad Men, but mm. it would, the suit would be Pete, whatever his name is, the horrible little sort who. Uh, yeah, I don't know, can't remember his name. Never watched Mad Men. Oh, you must watch Mad Men. Only briefly, a, a caught uh, part of an episode. Yeah. You should watch it all the way through because it's beautifully produced and uh, and it is relatively, it's a bit of a pastiche of the advertising business, but only just. Um, so these were people who were, Adrian, and Adrian by then was a, a friend and David was also a friend. Um, but neither of them wanted to join me in business. Um, so, so I ran. So I ran this agency for about four or five years, with the, the tortuous process of of deciding whether we should have two ply toilet paper or three ply toilet paper being examined, and uh, by five people at some length. Yeah. Three or four of them, as I said, didn't really want to be in management, but because. I empowered them, felt they had to contribute. I even found one of them reading Management of Machiavelli, so it demonstrates the sort of trouble I got myself <laughs> and And it manifested in them getting rid of me um, right. after five years. Uh, and then I started again and persuaded Adrian to join me, Adrian Vickers. And then within 18 months, two years, we then persuaded the superstar who was David Abbott to join us. Um, and it was three mates who got along like a house on fire. And and that that, that was it, sort of that the made rest. Of the all the difference. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. No, that's really good. I, it's always interesting how people get together and when it works, it works. And when it, when it works really well, things just go um, and climb yeah. and grow. Um, and when it doesn't, yeah, you either keep going. Or you just yeah, cut yeah, your I mean, and try to. Yeah, I think, I think the thing is though, people say don't do business with friends. Why wouldn't you do business with friends? Um, but but what you should never do is to do business with people who don't don't share your core beliefs or values. Mm. If they if they share those, then it's wonderful. Then your mates and you believe in the same things. Yeah. So everything everything becomes a sort of shorthand because uh, you all subscribe. And it's not brain surgery anyway, you know, it's sort of treating people decently, yeah. you know, valuing the work, um, all those sort of issues. None of them are eureka moments, they're all common sense. Yeah. Um, and and that, that makes things easy. Yeah. But it's also, I like the way you put it, but it's also like, it's almost like a lost element in a yep. lot of people's perspectives and um, well, because companies. Yeah. Because the world has worshipped people like Steve Jobs, for instance, uh, who obviously was a genius, um, mm. but um, uh, there's, there's a great biography of him uh, written by Walter Isaacson um, in which um, Walter Isaacson talks about Steve Jobs is sort of a uh, penchant for, I think, I think he called it reality distortion, which is telling porkies, I think. And, and Steve Jobs only cared about the end result. He didn't really care about people. It was a sort of Margaret Thatcher philosophy of achievement is all, but the means of that achievement are subsidiary to the achievement itself. Mm. You know, one might be one, one might be actually taking that view about Vladimir Putin right now. I mean, it, it's um, the achievement is nothing if it's if it's constructed on 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 un, inhumane yeah. uh, disregard for for people yeah. and, their, and their frailties. Yeah, absolutely. For anybody that's catching this, maybe in the future from where we're recording this now, we're just referring there to Russia at the moment as we're recording this. They are um, invading Ukraine or have invaded Ukraine. 
Um, so that that's the point of reference that we're talking about there. But it's a very good picture and example um, that you give. With regards to maybe within the last couple of years, um, let's sort of jump forward slightly just because you've kind of had to navigate through the whole COVID scenario as, as well as every everybody listening. Um, mm-hmm. And you're very, very aware of kind of the elements that are needed for good hybrid working as, as the world is sort of adapted and, and changed. Um, what would be some of the things, because I, I, I still think that is a big challenge. Companies are still working out how to do that well. Um, mm-hmm. I think there's also, from the business owner's perspective or whether they're employees as well, we all have a certain responsibility to contribute to making it work well. So it would be keen to get your perspective on how can you help business owners and also team members to to really make the hybrid thing work for both parties? Yeah, it's incredibly difficult. I think it's it's um, I, I should I should say I'm an unashamed believer in that that when you put people together physically, you create a sort of energy and a synergy yeah. which makes things happen. That, that, uh, so so before we start. I, I love um, working in an environment, a physical environment, where people are together, who are laughing with one another, talking about what was on television last night, talking about issues with clients, whatever. So, mm-hmm. so before we start, I'm, I'm biased and have a prejudice. So, but with, with that comes a lot of responsibility. I think employers have to understand that We've got to persuade people to come back to the office. There's the, to mandate people to come in five days a week is cloud cuckoo land now because yeah. with with everything that's happened and and the sort of um, the environment where we have lawyers uh, who would say to anybody, "You can't be forced to go back to the office." You know, it's you're putting your life at risk. I tell you what, we'll sue your employer. So, you know, we're, we're, we're overlaid with, 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 with the potential for that to happen. So what we, there will be a whole bunch of people, and by and large, they tend to be younger people who've had two years of working from home in cramped surroundings, um, sharing a bedroom with a computer as well as their girlfriend or wife um, and and some of their kids who can't wait to get back um, uh, to the office. But the office, but, but at the same time as, as COVID was happening, there was a move to hot desking where mm. people didn't have a desk and they had to, had to sign in for their desk and, and loads of companies have been doing that. Um, and that, that doesn't work anymore. I think we, we just have to say to people, please come back to the office because we think it's good for both of us. Um, and in order for you to do that, we've created a new environment where, and, it, and I, you know, some of the social media companies have, have, have been doing this forever. But we, for instance, have always had uh, a breakfast bar in the agency mm. where anybody who arrived before nine o'clock got a free breakfast and then in the evenings from 5 30 onwards it was a free but not free bar but a highly subsidized bar mm. uh, because what we wanted to do is to put people together to talk about life but also to talk about work issues yeah. and also talk about the the, the the place and how it could be better and and how they could contribute and um, so uh, I I think, you know, it, it, it's much more than the two-dimensional problem people are talking about at the moment mm. by saying, well, there are some people who want to stay at home and other people who don't, and it's hybrid. And, uh, and of course, there was a great story at one of our, our agencies uh, in a Latin American country um, who um, went to their personnel department and said um, I'd like a raise um, I've been working for home and I, I need a raise and the PRP or the 
personnel guys, the human resources guys said, okay, um, and rang one of our other agencies and said, hey, wouldn't you pay this function in your agency? And, and they, they started talking about it and suddenly discovered that this guy had been working for both the agencies without anybody knowing, you know, because he didn't have to turn up. He just yes. had to, he had to sort out his electronic life so that he was available to each agency at a certain time and was taking two salaries home. And so you will, you know, in the, in this hybrid existence, yeah. you will get people who, who are much less productive uh, than they've been before. You will get the majority of people who actually abide by the rules and, and work in a hybrid fashion as hard as they would in the office. Yeah. But but at the end of the day, as, as we were talking about off camera earlier, if we're not careful, we become a sort of insular society. We become yeah. a sort of, sort of digital robots where, you know, we don't go to work, um, we work from home, we order our food from Deliveroo, um, and if we don't do that and we want to cook, a Kaido came around, come around, Anything we want to buy, we, we dial up Amazon and it's their Amazon Prime the following day. Hmm. We stream all our television stuff uh, from Netflix or Disney or Apple or whatever. Yeah. And, and we forget that life is all about relationships. As I've, as I've said on many occasions and I say in the book, that it's a lesson I learned from an estate agent way back. Uh, when you're buying or selling a property, an estate agent will say there are only three things that are important. That's location, location, location. And my view about business and life in general is there are only three things that are important. That's relationships, relationships, and relationships. Yeah. If you can develop relationships, anything is possible. If you can't, nothing is possible. Yeah. And, and it's much easier if, there are, if, you're, if you're with somebody physically rather than doing as we're doing today, um, having an electronic conversation. Yeah, yeah. It's also, yeah. there's there's that, the element I found personally from my experience, there's more of a buzz if you get the right people together, like in an environment, in a community kind of scenario where you're building or there's a feeling that you're building something together, mm -hmm. which I think is fostered a lot easier, like you say, in the face-to-face the banter the conversations um which is to some extent lost when we go virtual um, yeah it's, but, it's yeah it's you know we want to belong to tribes we are we are we are tribal things yeah. you know it, again i took a, a one at one stage in my life well for all my life i guess i've been infected by uh, an incurable virus which is supporting Millwall football team. Uh, from my dad taking me there to stand behind the gold in the rain when I was eight to be chairman uh, of that club wow. uh, in the 90s. Um, and you see how critically important being part of a tribe, being part of that, that in that case, you know, a football tribe, um, how important it is to people. They find great solace and comfort yeah I'm, you know I, I, I don't want to be patronizing but i'm not being patronizing because people do find a comfort in uh, in in being together in a group yeah and you can't get that electronically you can't you know if we do if we do a zoom or a teams or a vector or whatever and there are 10 of us around and there are little pictures of each of us and they flick in and out whenever we're speaking the result isn't anywhere near as good as if the ten of us were sitting around a boardroom table. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You also, like you mentioned, or used the football example in your book as well, with regards to people feeling that they can express their opinions. Uh, so yeah. They can't in the workplace necessarily, but yeah. at the football pitch they can. And I think that's a really good way of kind of shining a light on so certain leadership management attitudes where they don't ask for that much input from their team it's it's very aut autocratic and just get on with it this is what needs to happen and mm. 
there needs to be a better balance of, like you say, the relationship side of things. Um, actually building a good relationship where there's mutual respect, you, you have different roles, different responsibilities, um, so you should definitely sort of focus on those, but also build that connection, kind of a depth of relationship, which will then, we touched on before about psychological safety, and just if you're able to win people's trust in an authentic way, you will draw so much more out of them with regards to ideas and suggestions. Of course. Um, even if the first few you don't run with, you don't think are, are workable, you just keep fostering that open communication, don't you? That then people start to feel a little bit more courageous about maybe suggesting bigger things or more outside of the box kind of things, which could be the very thing that, that helps, you know. Sure, then and there's, like a, there's a there's very there was a very famous, and still is, uh, company who make amazing chairs the Charles Eames chair you know the, the classic leather wood chair uh, designed by Charles Eames but manufactured by a company called Herman Miller and and they're a byword for worker participation and the CEO of, of various CEOs of Herman Miller say look you know we talk about design but actually the guys who put it all together in our factories on the shop floor have so much to contribute in, in in making the manufacturing process easier or even the design process easier because they live with it. So mm -hmm. we have to create an environment where their opinion is listened to uh, and believed, you know, and and that's what we used to do at AMB. I, I would once a month have breakfast with a whole random group people within the agency, you know, from board account directors down to the office boys and literally say, now, come on, you're the boss for the day. What would you do? And nice. there are amazing pearls that come out of that, yeah. you know, uh, as long as, as lo and, and people sort of understood that there was a sort of speed limit. So that they wouldn't, you know, none of them would say uh, there was danger. Some of them might say, I triple everybody's salary <laughs> because people understood that, that this was a serious question and and that their opinion was going to be listened to, which yeah. is absolutely central. And it's and it's and it's a valuable sort of weapon that lots of people ignore. You know. That, 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 uh, yeah. Anyway. No, no, it, it's a good point that you make. Let me just, um, I want to, time is going a bit, but there's a hundred lessons in the book, so I knew we were only going to scratch the surface, but anything uh, with regards to, so we've talked about trying to get people connected and involved and that, for people that are underperforming, how, any lessons, tips, strategies you can kind of um, share that would help people deal in a positive way with somebody that is not doing what they're supposed to do? Yeah, well, the, well, well firstly, you have to, as, a, as an employer, I believe, you, you have to accept your share of responsibility for that person uh, uh, underperforming. It, it could be that you recruited the wrong person and they're not performing because they don't feel comfortable or or don't understand the ethos of the organisation. Um, so having said that, you make every attempt to try and encourage them. It's like going back to football again. There are some footballers who need their bums kicked and, and other footballers who need an arm around the shoulder, you know, and, yeah. and the great trick of a Pep Guardiola or an Alex Ferguson or some of the great football managers was to understand which person needed what treatment. Um, so I think you you would actually sit, spend time with those people who are underperforming um, and find out whether there was some deep-rooted reason for them underperforming, which was, we talked earlier about capturing an unfair share of people's heads and hearts. Yeah. I mean, they were maybe they were underperforming because they, they weren't able to give the company a, a large share of their head because there are other things that were bothering them. So we should find out what those other things are and, and try and address them, particularly mm. 
if they were something that was happening as a result of their treatment within the company um, and give them every chance but understand that every so often you, you have made a mistake and hired the wrong person and then you should correct it i mean one of one of the proudest things that we had at Abermead Vicky Vicar is that for the first 25 years of its life, while we were running it, of course, the old boys were running it, we never declared anybody redundant, ever. Mm -hmm. um, throughout the 90s and all that, we, we didn't declare people redundant. But we fired people. We asked people to move on because they weren't right and we'd made a mistake. Yeah. But we made sure they were treated with dignity when we asked them to move on, that they were treated generously, and that they went with our best wishes. Um, so, you know, so this isn't this isn't a sort of uh, Cadbury Roundtree jobs for life at all costs sort of syndrome. Yeah. It's actually making sure that the people, if you're not performing. You're not going to be happy anyway, yeah. uh, um, and you might very well be happier elsewhere. You know, there, there may be you know people are there who who don't like the way I handle clients or sell ads or whatever. Yeah. In which case, they really should go um, and find. And I don't mean that in any sense rancorously. I mean, I just rancorously is that word? You know what I mean? Um, <laughs> it, um, you know, the, the you owe it to them. Yeah. to try and make them better and if you can't to 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 help them to ease their way into a better life elsewhere yeah it's healthier for them and the organizations isn't it long term you, yeah you have to get them in the right place and sometimes it is it's the leader's responsibility to almost politely kick if that's the right word or, or move them on because for whatever reason they're less likely to do it if they're getting a salary and stuff stuff they're more likely to stay miserable and get paid then maybe take the plunge of looking for another job so sometimes it is down to us to have the hard conversations isn't it so but yeah. i like i like the way you put it as well it's um yeah it's there's both both sides um have a certain level of responsibility um, totally and well arguably the employer has more of a share of the responsibility than the individual because we're we persuade the individual to join us you know so yeah. probably not 50-50, it's probably 60-40 that they're there because we wanted them to be there. And if we made a mistake, it's completely and utterly unfair to blame them totally. Yeah. It's, a, it's a shared responsibility. Yeah, yeah. No, it's really good. And another thing I saw in your book, nice and talented, they're the two kind of caveats, aren't they, to recruitment? You can't have yeah. someone that's nice but not talented or someone that's talented but not, not nice because there's no culture fit. It's not no, work. no, no, it's, and it's yeah. unfair on the rest of your people, you know, because it was just one of the great advertising men of all time who, who made that, that comment. Uh, and he said, literally, if they're talented but not nice, there's, uh, no, if they're nice but not talented, there's no room for them. Yeah. But equally importantly, if, if not, not more so, if they're talented but not nice, there's no room for them either. I'm, not, yeah. I'm getting all my nice and talented mixed up, but... If you, because because a, a company, if you if you're running it properly, is like a community. Is you know the great thing, or even Abermead Vickers over the years has been described as a sort of family, um, and it is a sort of family. You know where yeah. where people go exist and uh, and enjoy one another's company, enjoy you know the Italian, if you like, ethos of family where. Everybody looks after everybody else. I mean, David Abbott, my partner, sadly, who passed about eight years ago, said once, um, we should care for each other because if we care for each other, then everything else will take care of itself. Um, and that's that's a pretty good and, and fundamentally artistic by which you should run your business, probably your life as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. This has been brilliant. Thank you, Peter. Um, you've shared a lot of great insights. I know there's a lot more in the book. Um, you know, because of time, we've not been able to to go that deep into a lot of the different areas. Um, and also, also my my complete and utter inability to get the electronics right. 
No, 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 you're all good. You're, you're all fine. No, absolutely. It's, it's been a great discussion. I've learned some stuff. Certainly, and I'm thinking in the background as, as you're chatting, and okay, I can make a few changes um, myself as well, which is good. I like one of the points you started off with as well, quite near the start, about kind of not holding stuff too tight if you're running a business. Yes, have a strategy because you can't get momentum without a strategy, but also be, be open and flexible enough to embrace opportunities mm-hmm. as and when they arise and when you recognise that, that it's a good thing. Um, I think that's fundamental. For everybody listening, maybe that's the takeaway that you need. Or maybe it is just work on building the relationships with your team, with your staff, whoever it is that you lead or interact with. Because if you master good relationships, then it's going to overspill to potential clients, other Mm -hmm. people that you meet as well. There's no downside to it when you get it right. Um, And a lot of the stuff that Peter shared today will really help maybe reframe certain things or just use it as a checklist against behavior that you've had. What's the culture like where you are? Are you setting it in a good way? Are you looking after people? Uh, Have you got a culture at all? Have Mm. you got a culture at all? You know, do you understand what culture is? Um, Yeah. And, but the the central thought I'd like to leave you uh, with is, is David's thought that we should care for each other because if we do that, everything else will take care of itself. Yeah. It sounds simplistic, but it isn't. It's actually no, absolutely. the core of everything we do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's the fundamentals, isn't it? If we get the fundamentals wrong, whatever we build on top, it just, it's not going to last. So. It doesn't matter. It's, um, so it's all in my little book called Nice is Not a Biscuit, available at Amazon and all good booksellers. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And for everybody listening, I highly recommend grab a copy. Um, Peter's track record in business. Um, by itself, let alone the discussion we've had today, um, but that by itself proves the fact, fact that he's learned some things and he's put it in a book because he wants to get the message out there to make the world a better place, to make business a better place. Um, and it's all about looking after people fundamentally, yep. which is really good. Thank you, Peter, for your time. We do need to wrap it up now, um, but it's been really great chatting with you. Um, and thank you for sharing your expertise as well. Absolute pleasure. Thank you. It's been brilliant. And for everybody else listening, thank you for joining us too, and we will catch you next time.